Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Contemporary Classic Music Portfolio Ukraine presentation. We are very grateful that uh, you all managed to find the time tonight to learn more about Ukrainian uh, music scene, and we are looking forward to a splendid and uh, fantastic evening together with you. Uh, I'm happy to be here as a creative producer at Give Contemporary Music Days. And while we are still waiting for some guests to join, let me quickly guide you through our program for tonight and introduce briefly our participants. So today we will present to you the contemporary classic music portfolio from Ukraine. We will unpack a bit what a portfolio is, uh, reveal in more details when it can be used uh, and how it is useful for you, how you can use it, and why uh, there is such need to create such tools uh, these days. Uh, to do this in the best possible way, we asked Les Vinogradov, uh, the head manager of the portfolio project, as well as project manager in Kiev Contemporary Music Days, um, but also a great translator and musician, to make a small virtual tour inside the portfolio, uh, which became available to the general public just today. So after that, we will dive into a panel discussion among some portfolio participants, namely Sasha Andrusik, Adrian Mokanu, Jana Shlebanska, and Albert Saprikin. And our moderator of the discussion, uh, whom we feel very privileged to have here today with us, is Lisa Benyes, uh, Director of Initiative Music Berlin and Field Notes, and the special information partner for the portfolio. Um, at this point, I would also like to highlight that unfortunately not all portfolio participants as well as members of our team are present at the presentation today, uh, because as you probably know, after Russian full large scale bombing of the critical infrastructure of Ukraine, it is currently quite difficult to, to have a stable electricity supply and internet um, on a stable basis. However, uh, some were able to join from abroad and some even from Ukraine. Therefore, we apologize in advance for possible connection disruptions and invite our Ukrainian guests to feel free to disconnect and return back to the Zoom whenever it is needed. Um, after the discussion, we will have enough time for questions from the audience. Please feel free to address them not only to the panelists, but also to other portfolio participants who are present with us today. We invite our guests in the Zoom to write your questions in the Zoom chat at any point you would like, even right now. Uh, and our team will make sure that they will be addressed during the Q&A. We also encourage you to simply raise your hand during the Q&A um, in the bottom of the screen and pose your questions directly. We would like to hear your voices, of course. And we are also streaming this event on YouTube and Facebook pages. Therefore, our broader audience can leave their questions there, and we will try to forward most of them to our speakers as well. Uh, however, unfortunately, we will not be able to see the questions of those of you who are watching the stream on one of our streaming partners' resources. Um, and this being said, we would like also to thank uh, our great streaming partners, uh, such as the Nemos Publishing, Ensemble KNM Berlin, Huddensfield Contemporary Music Festival, uh, In City Manoi Music Berlin, Lviv National Philharmonic, Music Protocol, Music Biennale Zagreb. Uh, here comes the difficult one. I'm sorry, I'm not a German speaker. Österreichische Gesellschaft für Zeitgenössische Musik and Ukrainian Contemporary Music Festival. So nev nevertheless, after the Q&A about an hour from now, an online concert will begin with the works of the composers selected for this edition, first edition of Portfolio. During the concert, Zoom guests will have the opportunity to read small insights that we have prepared about composers and their works directly in the chat. Uh, the program for the concert is also going to be in the chat. Please feel free to start the discussion there if you would like uh, as well. That's like an open stage for all of us to uh, talk. Uh, so I think we are done with the organizational questions for now. And let's see if I can also say a couple of words about the portfolio project in our team. Uh, so as for the portfolio itself, 
It is a project that was implemented by Keep Contemporary Music Days team over the last two and a half months, since October 2022, we started to work on it. Uh, it was developed, curated, and implemented by Les Vinogradov, Albert Saprekin, and my not very humble self, with the expert support from musicologists Yuri Chekan and Maria Titova. Uh, Maria also supported our communications under the supervision of Dmitro Babenko, our head of communications. Uh, all the vis visual solutions, design and development of the portfolio was on the strong shoulders of Polina Horodiska, who not only managed to prepare everything in just a few months, but did it from Kyiv between electricity cuts and air raid alerts, uh, and same working conditions for Olha Sauch and Vasil Lutzik, our financial and local departments, and Maxim McLean, our video editor. So we are very grateful for all that work and uh, thanks to all their impressive uh, efforts. Today we are finally here at this presentation and thanks to the careful technical supervision of Dmitry Babenko and Mikhail Chidrik, uh, we should probably start getting to know our guests more. Um, last but definitely not least, the very important part is um, uh, to highlight that the project would not have happened without the support and funding from the Stabilization Fund uh, for Culture and Education of the German Federal Foreign Office and the Goethe Institute. So we are very glad and honored that today we have the opportunity to welcome on this virtual stage Reimer, Reimer Volker, uh, head of music uh, at Goethe Institute in Munich. Um, I also have a very brief I guess, um, um, notes about Reimer. Uh, and I think it's it just worth mentioning that uh, he, he holds a PhD in musicology from the Technical University of Berlin. Um, he first worked as an editor uh, at a literary publishing house for a few years before joining the Einstein Forum and independent think, think tank in Potsdam, Germany as a staff member in 2022. In 2005, he joined the Goethe Institute. Following uh, his training in Cairo, Egypt, he was uh, posted to Kolkata, India, and then to Seoul, uh, South Korea, and Istanbul, Turkey. Very impressive, by the way. <laughs> so, Reiner Volker uh, is currently head of the music department and Goethe Institute head office in Munich, where he assumed his position in October 2021. And I would, should just probably stop talking and pass the mic to our dear guest, Reimer. Thank you very much, Daria, for the introduction. And, the, uh, and let me say at the very, uh, and of course, uh, to the and also uh, to Albert for the invitation. And at the very beginning, I'd, I'd like to, uh, also on behalf of the Goethe Institute, express my admiration for the work that you're doing. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's really very impressive and it's a, it's a huge, honor and privilege for me to be able to speak to you this evening, especially since, as you mentioned, my, uh, I haven't actually, I'm relatively new to, to working in, uh, in, in, in Germany. I've been abroad for a very long time, um, uh, but, but I know uh, from my colleagues, close colleagues, um, how important the work of the, the Goethe Institute in the Ukraine is. And I'd just like to maybe outline a few things. Um, a uh, few, few of the, few of our, would um, the history or what, what makes the connection so important, and why, why we, why this is this project and generally um, cultural work and musical cultural work in Ukraine is so dear to us. Uh, generally, I think that we all know that's why we're here. That music as a bridge and as a means of communication, um, especially in very difficult times, is so important, and it's a, it's a life-giving force, really. Um, and you can see that very much in the portfolio, I think, of the contemporary music days. So the Goethe Institute in Ukraine uh, was uh, opened in 1993 and um, is still operating as we speak, as it were. Many of the staff members are, are some of the staff members are still uh, in the Ukraine. Some of them are in, uh, um, in other parts of, of Europe and some of them are actually in Munich. And then, as a matter of fact, I just only a few moments ago spoke to Fabian Mutala, the wonderful um, director of the Goethe Institute Ukraine who's in, uh, currently working from Munich. So he also gave me a few pointers and, uh, and refreshed my, my memory on uh, some of the projects and the long long line of, um, of, 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 of projects and, and, and 
um, and musical initiatives that the Goethe Institute has supported in, in Ukraine, including, of course, the Kiev Contemporary Music Days, the Kiev Symphony Orchestra. Um, what we are, some of the events that are coming up this year, uh, if possible, uh, we will certainly be supporting the Festival Contrast in Lviv. And there's also a project, project I believe, with the Nova Opera Kiev. So there's quite a few things are coming up from the head office. Uh, Daria also mentioned that in her opening. We have various tools and means to support as uh, best we can cultural activities um, in Ukraine, but also uh, Ukrainian cultural activities in Germany. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but we have this, uh, this matter with a matching fund. There's a fund for musicians, composers, artists in general in, who need support in Germany in exile. We have a Ukrainian music fund um, that we, 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 we initiated together with the Ernst von Siemens Musikstiftung. We were very strong supporters, as most of you know, of uh, contemporary music and composition. We managed to support 12 projects through that uh, fund. And we also um, uh, support the Ukrainian Youth Orchestra. It was a very moving uh, tour uh, here in, in Germany in the summer. Uh, and, um, and then we have a very big... Um, event uh, or rather series as it were, or maybe venue, I don't know, it's difficult to put it into words. It's the Goethe Institute in Exil. So we have a, a venue, a site in Berlin at the Akut, where we've been, um, it's a kind of uh, hub for all kinds of activities for institutes that are under, under pressure for different, either in exile completely, which fortunately isn't the case for, uh, with Ukraine, but there was a very long program uh, on um, music, or oh, sorry, the arts generally from Ukraine. That's that was the initiating initiative. Sorry, the, the the initial event, as it were, was the was the Goethe Institute in exile with a program from the Ukraine, um, and uh, at at the Akut, which would be followed by events uh, from Iran and Afghanistan. But there were also continue to be uh, Iran, um, um, Ukrainian events. And not, last but not least, I'd like to maybe point your attention to a series of um, podcasts that my own department has, um, uh, has come up with. It's a, it's a series called Time Zones that you can also subscribe to on, the, on your various um, podcast channels. I'm very, very happy to have a, um, in this, the time, time Zones is a sort of, it's a soundscape portrait of, um, of countries and cities. And I'm very, very happy to announce that the Time Zones Ukraine edition, which was um, which we which we put together with um, Dmitry uh, Fedorenko, uh, will be out on December 29th. So if you want to make a note of that, I'm sure that'll be quite fascinating. Um, it's a it's a really interesting, very interesting podcast, and I, I very, very much look forward to that. So this is just a very, very broad um, uh, strokes. Um, the various tools and commitments that we have to, to, the, to the work going on in and with the Ukraine. I personally have learned a lot and made very, very interesting uh, connections and friends such as with, uh, Daria and Albert. I'm extremely happy that we can support so many projects, especially this project. And I look forward to an exciting evening and very many new perspectives and exciting music and discussion this evening. And I hope we all, I'm quite sure, quite confident that we all have a a wonderful evening together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is a lot of interesting things you have mentioned, and I guess we will all follow up on that podcast details, mm -hmm. read in the words uh, as well. Um, thank you. Uh, pleasure. Um, without further ado, I would probably just head the mic to Bles Vinogradov, whose careful creation made this portfolio what it is at the moment, and he's, he's the person to speak about it more and uh, introduce it a little bit to all of us today. Thank you, Dasha. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, tonight. It really means a lot to us. Um, so since February 24th, uh, it's become kind of our mantra uh, to call on our fellow musicians, scholars, and music institutions around the world with these words. Uh, please choose to include Ukrainian music in your programs, uh, discover Ukrainian culture, uh, give a platform to Ukrainian voices, uh, collaborate with Ukrainian musicians, composers, musicologists, and other music professionals. 
And many people actually were getting back to us asking uh, where, where they could find more information about the Ukrainian uh, new music scene. Uh, and that's when things got a little tricky uh, because there are in fact a few resources out there uh, about Ukrainian classical music. Uh, there is the Ukrainian Institute's uh, music catalog uh, that has a section about contemporary classical music, uh, but it's focused on musicians and ensembles, not really organizers. And there's also the Ukrainian Live Classic project, uh, which uh, has a huge list of composers uh, and even free scores, uh, but it's not specifically focused uh, on contemporary classical music. So even though there have been great projects uh, showcasing Ukrainian classical music to international audiences, uh, there hasn't been a practical online tool uh, for uh, music professionals uh, to seek collaborations uh, with their Ukrainian counterparts uh, in the field of new music. And that's exactly what we are attempting to create with the contemporary classical music portfolio Ukraine. So I guess um, it, it is this time of the evening and I will finally show you uh, the website. So let me share my screen with you. Uh, uh, can you. Can you see it? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. So uh, here it is, uh, the portfolio. Uh, so as you will learn, uh, it has a fairly simple structure. Uh, at this point, uh, we have only three main categories. Uh, we have organizations and individual professionals. Uh, we have composers and also uh, the media specialized in uh, new music. Um, and um, on the main page, um, you can basically already see all the profiles that made, made it to the portfolio at this uh, stage. And I think uh, it's, it's really uh, worth mentioning that um, uh, in, no, in no way is this an exhaustive uh, list, uh, nor is it some kind of a uh, hall of fame. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a curated selection, and of course it has its limitations. Uh, the uh, Keep Contemporary Music Days uh, team uh, came up with a long list of candidates uh, then we had a round of consultations uh, with colleagues in the field and asked their advice. Uh, and then we had to cut it all down to a list of no more than 30 profiles uh, uh, total, like due to uh, the lack uh, of time. Uh, so the current edition of the portfolio um, represents professionals uh, that we at KCMD uh, believe to be trustworthy partners uh, based on our experience and the experience of our colleagues uh, from Ukraine. Uh, uh, these are the go-to institutions if you wish to cooperate with Ukrainian professionals uh, in the field of new, mu new music. So uh, the portfolio is uh, really an ongoing, uh, uh, an ongoing project. Uh, and uh, we invite all the composers and organizers in Ukraine who are not currently uh, uh, in the portfolio uh, to join. And to do that, you just have to follow this link uh, and uh, fill out a short form. Uh, and we will do our best uh, to uh, update the listing as regularly as possible. Uh, so if we look at our categories, uh, you will see that organizations and professionals uh, is in fact, this category is pretty diverse. Uh, and we have here uh, concert agencies, uh, but also uh, organizers uh, specialized in conferences, uh, or we have organizations that carry out uh, educational programs and so on. So uh, in case you're looking for a specific field of activity, we have this uh, very basic, very like very simple menu uh, with filters. So, for example, if you're looking for organizers, uh, particularly in in the field of conferences, for example, uh, you can just find them, you know, uh, filtered right here for you. It's like very simple. So, if we uh, look closer at uh, the profiles and how they are organized. Uh, you will find that 
they are all pretty much the same, very similar. Uh, here you have the contact information. Uh, here you have a short bio, if it's a composer. And then you have a list of selected works that the composers themselves provided with links. So you can listen to them right away. Uh, and then a list of awards uh, where it applies. Um, and uh, with uh, the organizations, with organizers, uh, the situation is pretty similar. Uh, so we see here the contacts, uh, again, short description, the about section, uh, and then you have the selected projects. Uh, rather than works. And again, you have links to them if you want to you know, learn more about them. Uh, and then uh, we also have the small uh, photo gallery, which works really as a teaser just to give you like a very uh, basic idea of what this organizer is doing. Um, so that's, uh, that's the typical profile of an organizer. And then we have media which, uh, well, honestly, at the moment, this section is uh, kind of lonely, uh, but we are really happy that uh, the media such as the clackers uh, exists in Ukraine. And in case you don't know them, uh, we really recommend to check them out. They have a great English language section on their website, and they cover pretty much yeah, you know, the stuff that is going on in Ukraine in terms of contemporary classical music, and it's all really quality journalism. So please uh, check them out. So um, yeah, that's that's the portfolio basically, and uh, as you can see, uh, it is designed mainly for organizers of events outside of Ukraine, uh, like international music institutions, uh, festival programmers, uh, conferences, and so on. Uh, and it allows you to find the right person uh, or institution in Ukraine uh, to work with, uh, be it a concert agency, a philharmonic, uh, a media, or a composer that you could approach to commission music. Uh, and with Portfolio, you have everything you need to know uh, about this person or institution uh, in one place with contacts uh, and all. So. Um, this is what we have on our portfolio at the moment. Um, we really wish to expand it. Uh, so uh, right now uh, we are really looking uh, to uh, add more composers. Uh, so like uh, expand the existing um, categories uh, that we have, but we, are, we would also really love uh, to add new uh, categories uh, such as the performers, like the musicians, ensembles, orchestras. Of course, that category would be uh, probably the, the biggest one. Uh, it would also be interesting to, uh, to add uh, the uh, uh, conductors uh, as well, uh, but that's in the future. And uh, as for now, we truly hope that you will find this tool uh, useful for you, uh, and we really hope that it will help launch some new exciting collaborations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Les. Um, thank you for this quite, I guess, joyful, insightful uh, dive in into portfolio. Um, I hope it was useful for everyone present. And now I guess it's time to meet some of the those people selected to the first edition of Portfolio, uh, the representatives of the Ukrainian new music terrain, um, and hear a little bit more of their perspective on the current uh, landscape of Ukrainian music and um, perhaps their insights uh, on the potential future co collaborations or their, how they can foresee them. Uh, but before our panel discussion will start, I would like to quickly remind that uh, we invite you to leave your questions uh, into the in the chat uh, of the Zoom or on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Otherwise, you will be able to just raise your question and ask their uh, raise your hands and ask your question directly. Uh, just waiting for uh, for us to invite you as a speaker at some point during the Q&A. Uh, now it is time to give the floor to Lisa Benyes, uh, Director of uh, Initiative No Music Berlin, Field Notes. Lisa, please take the lead. 
and just thank you Daniel. thank you just because i know that there's some of the board members also watching i'm not the director of the nm i'm just the director of the fitness program oh, i'm so, so sorry i'm so sorry absolutely fine it's just um i don't want to take credit for it <laughs> So, um, but thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for giving me uh, the chance to talk to the panelists. Um, we've had the chance to meet the team of the KCMD, the Key of Contemporary Music, based for the first time in May already for another panel discussion that was also online and, and streamed. And we talked about the situation of artists in the field of contemporary music in Ukraine under attack and how international uh, organizations could support the team. And since then, a lot has happened um, while Russia's aggression continues with attacks on energy and other civilian infrastructures. KCMD has successfully um, opened a fund to support Ukrainian music and has been able to collect numerous donations. So that's fantastic. The two festival directors, Albert and Daria, have now arrived in Berlin as fellows at the NM and KN in Berlin. So that's also wonderful for us, really. Um, and as I understand, they're now in the middle of planning a new festival edition in spring in Berlin, which is super exciting for us in Berlin. And today we gathered for the presentation of the latest project, the Contemporary Classical Music Portfolio. And to highlight the importance of this portfolio, I'd like to recall what Atlas just say, said in the introduction, but he already said it back then when we met for the first time for the first panel discussion, um, he identified the best ways how international organizations could support the Ukrainian culture. It was by discovering the Ukrainian culture, by giving Ukrainian artists the platform and by collaborating with Ukrainian professionals. And I think this portfolio offers now a much needed resource to get an in-depth in, um, overview on the Ukrainian's new music community and allows also international curators, ensembles and artists to get to know the key actors of the scene. And the value of this portfolio cannot be overestimated since Russian's war of aggression is also tar a targeted war on the Ukrainian identity, language and culture. And ironically enough, Russian's ambition to eradicate Ukrainian culture has led to it being more visible in the West than ever before. There's more Ukrainian music being programmed than ever, where the ties with Ukrainian actors have been strengthened significantly. And this is why I'm so happy that we can build on this today and to learn more about the landscape of contemporary music in Ukraine and the situation right now, and also get in touch and to talk with the composers and organization that are now represented on the portfolio. So I'd like to introduce you to the panelists. I don't know if you see them on the screen now when I read the names, but we'll, we'll try. Um, there's Sasha Andrisik. She is curator and director of the Yuho Agency. The Yuho Agency, Yuho means ear in English. And the Yuho Agency, yeah, there she is. <laughs> Uh, the Yuho Agency is a Kiev-based curatorial group. It's specialized in new music and improvised music. And it's known for experimenting with concert format, site-specific concert in unexpected settings, such as, and I've read that they're just some of them were in the Paleontological Museum, for instance. There was another one at the football stadium, and that's just to create new listening experience. The group has presented over 700 pieces of new music and music theater in Ukraine. And since 2015, Yuho is also associated with a fixed ensemble. There is Adrian Mukanu. Maybe you can also just wave in the camera. It's probably easiest if you put the sound on, then maybe it's okay. Good evening. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, He's a composer. He studied composition at the National Acad Music Academy of Ukraine. He completed his po postgraduate studies in Madrid. He, his music was performed on the big international festivals, and he was granted numerous scholarships and prizes. During 21-22, he was also one of the fellow composers 
of the post-colonial recherche with the ensemble recherche for those, for, especially for the Germans, um, probably well known. Um, and she pays, pays special attention to the musical tonal possibilities that tr uh, traditional instruments open up through unconventional playing techniques. There's Jana Schliabanska. Good evening, everyone. Hello. She's also a composer and a sound artist. She also studied composition at the National Academy of Music in Kiev. She writes chamber orchestral and electroacoustic music, but also creates interactive sound installations, music for theater and performances. Also her music has been performed on many European stages and the US. And she's also co-founder of the electroacoustic duo Guma. And last but not least, Albert Saprikin. He is composer and pianist, but also, and you know him from there probably already, a co-founder and director and team member of the Kiev Contemporary Music Days and one of the initiators of this portfolio. Hi. So, uh, hi, Albert. So thank you so, so much for um, asking me to do the moderation of this talk. I think. This is really, this portfolio is a game changer for everybody who's curating any concerts and um, in, in, um, in the field of contemporary music, because I feel that there's a strong wish of programming contemporary music, and I feel that there's more and more names, but often those names are already, at least for the German, I can only speak for the German landscape, but there are many names that are already quite known in the German speaking countries, and I think this portfolio is really going to help to um to present new faces um and i think Les just said that that was the intention as well to really focus on on, on curators so but i'm still very interested in, in how you created this portfolio what gives you the initiative because you're initially a festival i mean you're also a fund now you do many other things to support the entire scene but uh, what made you as a festival create this portfolio well, yeah, first of all, Lisa, thanks for, for accepting our invitation to moderate this talk. And thanks to Sasha and Jana and Adrian for joining it. Um, as Les, as Les Vinograd of uh, my teammates already mentioned, we, we've been talking to, like we've been publicly talking throughout this whole year uh, when the full-scale invasion uh, started like work with Ukrainians, reach out to Ukrainian organizations, uh, find someone to work with and make Ukrainian culture visible. This is uh, the way I see it is it's crucial. Uh, it is crucial instrument, one of one of instruments of making war, you know, and sooner. Uh, and uh, I, I feel really happy and thankful that um, a lot of representatives of music communities in different countries they actually listened so we started receiving requests like hey albert we're searching a composer to do this can you suggest someone so uh, and, uh, we were like we were we were doing tailored lists of comp of names for for one request then for another in terms of organizations so yes and in the end of september we realized that probably it's time to make uh, something like portfolio uh, a public place where organizations or people who are curators and composers who can be commissioned would be, become public and available to everyone so that we would not be the, you know, the holders of some secret information or rather just to have it available for everyone. So that was, this, that was kind of a logical step that we felt it is time to do. So we did, so we did it. Um, Les already talked a little bit about the selection processes you had, and I think that's, a, I mean, you must have felt a huge responsibility to say, this is now the Ukrainian contemporary music scene in this portfolio. So how did you, how did you um, approach the selection of it? Did you have any criteria? Um, did it have to be living composers? Did you, the level of performance? professionalism or working experience or training or whatever well first of all uh, i would like to say that this 
a portfolio is definitely, and we ask no one to perceive it in this way, it is definitely not a pantheon of best of the best, either organizations or composers. Uh, this is our first step to gather to collect the information. And as Les said, we, we did this project from scratch in two months, so we had quite limited time. So we decided to have just like a maximum of 30 profiles. Um, so yeah, the thing we, uh, the, way, uh, the way we want curators who are searching for a partner in Ukraine to perceive it is that, well, in terms of organizations, there is a list of organizations that we either know already that we can recommend uh, others to work with them. We know they are trustworthy or while talking to our colleagues in the music field, we did find out for ourselves, by ourselves, uh, about some curators or organizations. And then, yeah, then our goal was to, to, to organize them in such a way that if someone is searching for a partner to organize a conference, then there is a list of organizations who actually did conferences. So they have this experience already. Uh, or if they're searching for someone, so some organization with whom they would like to do an educational project like masterclasses, they can see organizations who actually did um, projects in the field of education already. That does not mean that some organization, some, some organization is not capable of doing in the future. Uh, it's just uh, we decide, we've chosen an approach which is about you know, just uh, the field is there, uh, the, the area of, of, of projects is there, if an organization did this already. And we're also thankful to all the organizations and composers who were communicating with Les, and I think Les were communicating with all 30 of them. I know it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, and so yes, I thank uh, everyone for providing information to us. So there's that. And in terms of composers, uh, there were, two, again, since we had just a month from the very beginning till today, uh, we were thinking to make an open call, but then we realized there's no, not enough time to do that. So Maria Titova, my friend, my colleague from KCMD, who is a musicologist, and I, we, uh, the team trusted us to uh, to create a short list. So first we did a long list, then we did a short list. There is definitely much more good Ukrainian composers than 15, definitely. So uh, yeah. And uh, in terms of the criteria uh, for composers, well, our idea is that these composers should be alive, therefore capable of being commissioned. I think this is an important thing. Uh, another thing, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> we tried to include composers who already have done some international projects, since we think that's like, when you have just 15 names, we can start with that, which again does not mean that there are no, com that, that others are not able to, 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 to work with, with partners internationally. Uh, and also, we did, together with Maria Titova, we agreed on that the music of composers should not, um, should not necessarily uh, be written in a style or in a way that we think music should be written. So that uh, in order for us to avoid the taste element, so to say, uh, um, yeah, and basically that is it. That's it. These were our criteria, and we, there are some. There, there is a couple of uh, others uh, that I just cannot uh, recall at this moment since it was two months ago. But we have everything in the, the documents. So yeah, that's that. That that's that's how we did it. And um, but what was the bigger um, decision about choosing to um, present uh, first and foremost organization and then composers? And um, are you planning on um, involving more ensembles, musicians, et cetera, in the future? Yeah, definitely. We are not planning yet, since if I say planning, that means we have already a plan and we know how to make it happen. 
we do not, we, we do not. And now now our plan is to have this zoom to go smoothly uh, but we do hope we do hope that next year we will find resources uh, to for 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 the team of seven seven i think seven seven people to work on the project in the future and to 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 make to maintain it and to make it bigger and to add additional um, yeah add information about ensembles or orchestras as i said or performers etc since um, actually there are a lot of and you will hear this today on the on on, on the streamed concert you will uh, there are a lot of great wonderful and sasha and Rusik can, can also back me up on this wonderful performers who play new music in ukraine so yeah there's that Super. I have just one last question about the role of KCMD within this portfolio in the now or even in the future. Um, do you, are you thinking or do you want to still be a touch point for questions or are you hoping that you provided the information and then in the future this will be independent and um, running without explicit intervention by KCMD? Um. Well, all the information about the organization is on the page uh, or on the portfolio page, including contacts. So um, our main, like our original intention is that anyone who would like to find some partner or a composer, they can just uh, have a look, use some links to listen to the music, etc., and then just uh, email uh, the person. But of course, in case if uh, some kind of informational support or whatever uh, is needed from our from from us we can definitely do that so we are open of course but that's yeah, great that's to know yeah because we we're, we're doing a, just a sort of a similar thing for the contemporary music scene in berlin and even though we have the the landscape on the website and everything i think it's always uh, nice to talk so, to somebody who gets an overview and who gets an introduction to the scene so i think it's always good to have somebody as a touch, first touch point at least, even even if you have all the resources. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much, Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, um, the contemporary music in Ukraine seemed to be very flourishing before the large scale attack. And I was taught that there was not only a long tradition of older and publicly financed institution, but there was also a contemporary music scene in Ukraine that it faced a big shift, especially in the last five years. Um, that was especially introduced by a younger generation of musicians and composers who were eager to promote their music and to grow a lively independent scene. I think some of them even have to, had their training in some other countries and then came back and brought some new uh, perspective on the scene. So. Jana, as you're a young composer yourself, um, how would you describe uh, the Ukrainian contemporary music scene before February 24th? Yes, uh, indeed, uh, I agree. For me, this is uh, also related to the development of Ukrainian civil society, which was especially evident after their revolution of dignity in uh, 2014. And uh, also, however, I want to note that uh, the development of the independent sector was more visible than institutional sector. Although, of course, there are exceptions. Um, we know about organizations that uh, not only had a successful experience of uh, organizing events or concerts of contemporary music, like Give Contemporary Music Days, UCO, but also in the formation of a community, both professionals and connoisseurs uh, around this music, which is, uh, in my opinion, very important. And I know that there's been a huge community of electroacoustic and uh, contemporary experimental music in Kiev and Lviv, and I think even in Kharkiv there was a vibrant community. So how did the war affect the musical life in those cities? And are there still any concerts running right now? Any events were in what scale? Or... Mm -hmm. So 
actually, I cannot say something specific about the electroacoustic music scene compared to the art scene in general, because um, some of artists are fighting, as you know, some of uh, them are volunteering, some uh, others have different problems regarding war, uh, also some are temporarily abroad. And uh, if they are able to produce something, uh, I'm really happy on that. Unfortunately, I, I also know that some artists do not feel uh, the power to express something uh, and feel dumb and powerless now, which is really, really, really hard. And um, if I may ask, how was it for yourself to be a composer in wartime? And uh, Yes, um, actually, um, I think that being a, comp a composer uh, today uh, during the war uh, is not so different from being Ukrainian uh, during the war. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes you need to survive um, Anyway, and uh, for example, my the biggest experience, the biggest impression is to spend uh, six days on at the railway station, and uh, it's um, it's totally erasing the personality uh, when when you when you start to live like this, and uh, uh, this is such an experience that you cannot forget forever and it's even hard to hard to explain this uh, so i cannot actually divide the personal experience and the composer's experience because uh, it's impossible and um, of course now i am safe I can uh, I can continue my work and uh, I'm really grateful for this, but still uh, I I really feel um, feel so hard about the people that uh, are not able to do this to do the same. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, do you think um, that this portfolio um, is? something that could be helpful for you in order to get new commissions and in order to make other contacts and yes uh, of course uh, it's a fascinating idea of uh, keep contemporary music days team and uh, when when i first uh, seen the uh, prototype of the website uh, which was sent to us I was so amazed uh, I said wow it's so fantastic even for me uh, if since I know my colleague and uh, I know something about their art but even for me it's so interesting to know about them more and uh, I, I think it's very good to to have this collection of information and uh, to it's like um, how do we express our our community actually a community of ukrainian composers artists community of contemporary music in ukraine so uh, i think it would be very very helpful for for other yeah i think i think that's something that's very beautiful about it i mean the reason why this portfolio was set up is obviously the saddest but the, it's gonna stay and it's gonna create new touch points and contacts and this is actually something that's going, that's investing in the future. So, um, yes, yeah. yes, indeed, indeed. And also these relations and contacts that, that we make right now, it will really help when we uh, will come back home and we will need to restore our country. And I think all the experience are very important to, to build something further. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you. Um, so, Sasha, with the Yucho Agency, you work within an ensemble and uh, a collective in general. So, everything you do is in a group. And I imagine, especially working in a group, has been very difficult at the moment. So, could everybody of the group of your collective stay in Kiev 
or how do you organize your work in general at the moment? Well, in truth, Ucho is not a big group at all. So we have a long track record of working. It's We've been up for something like 10 years now, uh, but it has never been a big group. So we, we have been always maybe four or five people, sometimes extending to a much larger group when we needed to run something large, like an opera, for instance. Uh, but in truth, of course, it has been very significant for us as well. And despite the fact that four out of the five people managed to stay in Kiev and were staying in Kiev all through 2022. And in fact, we just left uh, a week ago, uh, thanks to the Ukrainian Music Fund, because that was our first opportunity to perform something outside. Uh, but in truth, almost everyone is in Kiev, with the exception of one person. Um, but, and it's something that Jana has already mentioned a little bit, um, at least for two people, of course, the focus has changed completely because they, they would rather work directly with helping those in need and those, in, uh, those who are facing emergency situations, not through music, uh, but just through direct volunteering. Um, yeah. As for instance, had been the case with our head artist, Katja Liebkind, who has been vol volunteering in the psychiatric hospital in Kiev uh, from early March. Um, uh, or with uh, Katja Sula, our project manager, who was working also with disabled kids all through this period. So, uh, so of course, like the focus was very shifted very much. And then, and and it's a bit different for the ensemble because this, like the five people story, of course, is a story of the curatorial group. Uh, whereas the ensemble, which is one of the branches of Ucho, um, is seventeen people plus conductor. But there, uh, it's a bit more dramatic in a sense, because uh, mostly those people are some of the best Ukrainian soloists. And of course, there is, uh, it is very difficult to support uh, a music career uh, performing in Ukraine now. Um, and in a sense, it is perhaps uh, even more important to be outside and to be this Ukrainian voice outside. So many have left and we're now an ensemble, like the, the full name of the ensemble is Ucho Ensemble Kiev, but it is dispersed uh, between 10 towns in Europe now, you know, because people are playing now in different orchestras and quartets everywhere. And we have to, to, to run a project with them, we have to literally be bringing them from all over the place. Okay. And were you actually able to realize any projects since uh, February? That's, uh, that's a good question. So, <laughs> so, in truth, we had to refocus completely uh, and we haven't done not a single performative uh, project in Kiev throughout this year. Um, and it was not because of the, it's not even because of the safety uh, issues, um, but more because of the intensity of this experience uh, and the way we put concerts together, uh, because for us, it has always been very much about the context for us as curators, I mean, uh, because we try to think of a concert as a gesture. So for us, presenting someone's music has always been a gesture or a collection of gestures where it always mattered where you present this music with who you present it for who, what is the setting, what is the stage art, if there's any, you know, what is the format of this, etc. Um, and we found that this, um, that, that, you know, that a good gesture is something that is timely, and is something that's um, sort of sits right in its place and time and setting. And it is almost impossible to do something like this in Kiev when being a music curator, because situation changes hourly. And something that seems like a very great idea in the morning is no longer a great idea after news falls in you towards the evening, for instance. And it, it would have, we just, we discovered it very early that you would have felt like a race uh, that we do not want to have because it's a bit of a race with death really. Like I'm, it, it's a strong word, but it's true. And that we do not want to be in this race. Uh, even if we understand that for our listeners, of course, it would have been a communion in any case. And that, you know, this, this the concert, every concert now in Kiev, in fact, is a communion. And in this sense, I applaud to those who managed to host them, but unfortunately for us, it has been impossible. And then another thing also that sort of uh, explains this a little bit more perhaps is that um, UHO is an organization that was founded by listeners. So we, we were not uh, coming from professional music background. And 
It literally translates as ear. And at one point we thought that for us, the, the principal gesture that we could do is actually to listen to this landscape, the way it is, to the landscape that Kiev is right now. And in terms of sonic part of it, uh, it has been tremendously painful and also extremely intense because when you speak of a Kiev soundscape at present, you speak of 700 air raid alarms in nine months, and you speak of shellings and explosions, et cetera. And there's very, very little room for music to be presented within this landscape, truly. Um, and I imagine that if I, if I were a musician, perhaps it would have been possible for me because then the distance between thinking of something and putting this into life would have been very short or could have been short. But as a curator or as an organ or as an organizer, that that of course puts me in a very different setting. So that that would be like a, a part of the answer, perhaps to to your question. But another part would be that um, practically the solution that we came up with was that we decided that we'd rather ship the pockets to something else. So not performing does not mean not doing anything. Uh, and apart from this listening and witnessing, we thought that um, it's, it's, it's a good time to do something else. And for us, that would be a record label um, because I believe that uh, that's, 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 that, that's the thing that's actually very complementary to this portfolio, you know, because it's a great moment for us to see the Ukrainian scene of new music for what it is, you know, because we can actually meet each other through this website. And in this sense, it is uh, it is a great initiative uh, for for Ukrainians, just like uh, it is for people outside of Ukraine who want to collaborate with Ukrainians. But also another thing that's really important is that uh, uh, there is really little recorded music from Ukraine to date. You know, so like it's it's actually quite hard to to um, when advising the records or like when 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 thinking of the recorded stuff material is really not enough. And it's something that we have been thinking of for a while. And this has been our key project. So we are launching a record label in 2023. And the first 10 records would be mostly Ukrainian scene of new music. And then another thing that we focused on was this. What's the name of the label? That probably would be Kiev Dispatch. So original, original idea was that we leave it as Ucho but we're now thinking of maybe renaming it into Kiev Dispatch, yes. And we have, by now we have produced five, so the, the half of it is already produced and it's just a matter of scheduling sort of the, the launch and everything. But hopefully that would be happening towards autumn next year. Um, and then another thing would be then for us uh, working on, on the sort of, uh, on the projects that could, could use us sort of, uh, as a creative force without giving this performance right away. And for us, this has been a project with the National uh, Opera Theater in Ukraine because we're now commissioning a new repertoire piece for them from Maxim Kolomiets, who is also listed in this uh, portfolio. Um, and, and hopefully if everything works out, then already next winter we would be showing a premiere and that would be an opera on the early days of Kiev Mohila Academy, which is the first higher educational institution in Ukraine. Okay, wow, so exciting. Just um, make sure you'd let us know about, about the projects and the labels and everything. I'd be happy to feature it as well in our, through our channels. Um, uh, Adrian, so I think we've, um, we're we running a little bit out of time, so I'd like to also talk to you, Adrian, um, because um, culture has been specifically targeted within this war, and international agencies have monit been monitoring um, war-related damages to heritage sites in Ukraine, and museums got looted and so forth. So I was wondering, because I think you dealt with the subject a lot before, why do you think that culture is perceived as especially threatening? Okay, so good evening again, and thank you a lot for your question. Well, answering about this question, uh, you know, if you ask yourself, what are the key elements of uh, something that forms your national identity as a country and as a nation? And I think there are two key elements. One is the territory and the second is your identity, like your language and your culture. So what Russia is actually doing right now, they're 
take, they are trying to take away both from us. They are trying to take away the land, the territory, but they're also trying to take away and erase our language, our identity. And if you don't have your culture, well, I mean, then probably that nation will not last long. So I think this is one of the targets because it has crucial importance for forming this, you know, being one of the markers of your identity in terms of culture. And what do you think? Um, is this just my screen or because it's okay, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and what do you think is the role of culture right now? Do you think that it could be a way of resistance? Do you think it's it has a special role during this war? Well, it is a way of, okay, culture is force and it can, it can also be used as weapon. Actually, it can be expansive and it can be defensive. So if we look at the situation, uh, the war situation uh, from the perspective of culture, uh, it appears, and it, I think in my opinion, it is quite true that Russia is using culture in their own way, in terms of, okay, in, in a way of propaganda, but they are using it as an expensive weapon, trying to promote their, their narrative abroad, and especially in the West, in Europe, and uh, in the United States, for example. And I think in this context, the counter, the counter force would be presenting something, but not in, a, not in an offensive way, I mean, not in an expensive way, but... Uh, I think that Ukrainian culture has to be equally presented, uh, but I think in a different in a different way because it's not it should never be done by means of propaganda. It should be done honestly, and it should always be telling the truth and and talk about things the way they are. Yeah. Well, I think one one right side, if one can say so, is um, a huge process of national national building and the recollection of Ukrainian traditions and artistic um, practices and so forth. And do you think that the search for an identity has also an, an effect on how contemporary music is composed today? Like, is there a search for a special Ukrainian sound? Are there special instruments that are used more or playing techniques? Uh, well, you know, the search of identity is, uh, is something that I've been asking myself, this question I've been asking myself a lot, and I don't know if I have a right answer for it. I think each of us, each of the composers, and not only the ones presented here in the portfolio, but like everyone, literally everyone, if we ask this question, we would have different answers. In my opinion, I think of Ukrainian identity as something that should be, that should be connected, it should interact with Western culture, is something that is placed in the context of European culture because it's part of it and it has always been part of it and it suffered a lot from you know the the imperialism and colonialism and we're still dealing with these consequences uh, but at the same time you know I don't see culture as something that would be isolated something based solely on tradition I think there are a lot of influences from many other cultures and spheres and we, we should interact with them and try to build our identity remembering where we are coming from but also looking into the future yeah yeah i think well i mean the suppression of ukrainian culture is, uh, is going far far back as you said but I think on the other side, it's not just what's happening in Ukraine, but also how it is per perceived in, in other countries, in Western Euro European countries. And um, do you think there are any, any, anything that uh, composers or artists are doing, especially uh, to, to fight those perspectives on, and to counteract the biased perspective of the Ukrainian culture just being one part of a, I don't know, biggest so cultural um, specifics of the uh, Soviet Union? Well, I think that, you know, what Jana told earlier that, yeah, it's hard to be a composer because you also have to remain uh, being Ukrainian. Uh, but I think it's also like you have to be in the in the place where you are efficient where, and where you can do something that would benefit to, I don't know, to the bigger good. And 
I think it's a big responsibility if you're a composer. You have to speak about things if you, of course, if you feel power and the necessity to do it. Uh, and to transmit this message to to the international public and i think it for me it's extremely important to transmit some ideas and uh, just talk about even even you know not only like writing music but also talking as a person talking to people talking to institutions and giving them your opinion and your point of view because sometimes they just want to hear things like you know told by by a person who's who has seen it who has lived through it because it's not only like watching watching the news and reading uh, something uh, on, a, on I don't know on a website uh, but when someone who has experienced the this can talk about it through art I think it also can be of big value yeah um Thank you so much um, for all your answers. I'm really, so I think we're way over time, but we still haven't enough time to talk to everybody um, as much as we would have wanted to. Um, but maybe it is time for opening the panel for other questions um, or maybe some interjections and some more ideas. Um, In, indeed, it's a good time to start the Q&A. From my side, I will also just briefly say thank you to, uh, to all the panelists um, and to you, Lisa, for, for this fantastic discussion or like rather sharing of uh, feelings and ideas. And uh, we can continue going with the questions that I, I guess Lisa still have, but we also, I assume that we have people here who would maybe want to ask some questions or leave some comments. So in order to do that, you either can post it in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we will, um, yeah, just offer you the floor to ask the question. Um, please feel free to ask both to those who were just in, in the panel right now, the speakers in the panel, but also Maybe you have questions for other participants of the portfolio. Some of them are here today. So in case uh, they can answer, they would probably do so. And I guess that's, that's pretty much all the organizational part of it. Sometimes it takes a while um, until the questions come. So I'm just gonna grab the chance to just ask a very general question to all of you, because I was wondering, this portfolio is inviting us and in, in, in international um, partners to get in touch with you and to, I don't know, ask you to collaborate or to, to write a composition for us. But is there something that we should um, consider when we ask you to collaborate with us? Because as I heard, your working conditions are completely different. Sometimes you have energy cuts, there needs to be more time. I mean, some people are traumatized, I guess. Some some people are in deep despair or they, just from very practical things to, to very deeply psychological issues. I was wondering what, what do you think would be important for you to, if I, like to collaborate with you or even the question if if in the program which is found a lot in Germany I think is also the into um, if um, Russian artists are also involved in the project would is this something you would like to know beforehand or you know this is it's a question to all of you Yeah, it's including those, you know, the composers and representatives of, of organizations. So feel free if you have some some thoughts. I do see a few, a few composers uh, who are part of the portfolio. Maybe I don't want to uh, name names, but if you feel like joining, just hop in. Start. Uh, if 
Nobody mind. I will just start. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the last is uh, the most important, I think, for, for now nowadays. Uh, if the project is related to Russian artist or somehow, anyway, uh, I think it's very important to let uh, Ukrainian artists to know about it as soon as possible, because I know the cases, not from the music scene, but from the contemporary dance scene or theater, contemporary theater uh, scene, and uh, people were not informed about this, and uh, there was not, uh, there was uh, really complicated situations in the relations then. Uh, and uh, I think everybody will agree with me that uh, the position of us, I think all, of all of us is clear that we are not ready to, uh, uh, we are not ready to participate in any project that is related to Russian artists or, um, yes. Uh, I can explain why, but I, if, if it's needed, just let me know if, if it's needed to explain more why, but I think it's very uh, well discussed topic as from now. Yeah, thanks, Jan. I think everyone is just shy, but also feeling, yeah. yeah. I think we, we talked about all of that quite a lot and it's it's quite clear for the Ukrainian community. Sometimes when we are abroad, we still feel like that. That's kind of a question that probably some still need to be addressed in some uh, places, but then uh, a lot of people are quite informed already and quite, uh, recognize quite well how challenging and strange it could be to, um, to participate in the events that are uh, Organized in one way or another, involving both Ukrainian and Russian parts. Uh, yes, but still, but still, it's a very popular question. Uh, where I live today, I, I hear it very frequent, uh, frequently, and uh, it's uh, it's very popular to ask Ukrainian, why don't you want to uh, to collaborate with Russians? Would you collaborate with Russia or something like this? And uh, even and this uh, very popular uh, phrase that art is not a politic, you should not mix uh, art and politics and so on and so on. You should explain it again and again and again. And uh, it's also a part of, uh, I think, uh, of work of artists, how to, how to explain it correctly. And yeah. Yeah, indeed. On that note, I will also just briefly say that uh, KCMD actually preparing the statement that addresses this particular question. It's going to be on our website and all the participants of the portfolio have already seen it. So in case our uh, guests from other countries would want to learn more on the way how we approach this question and how we suggest to approach this question, uh, quite soon you will be you will be able to see it on our website. Maybe that's gonna bring a couple extra insights into how this this particular to topic can be addressed. Uh, so if we don't have any other questions and and I think we don't, we can probably slowly proceed. I just don't want to take the stage away from all these great people here. Okay, uh, once again, thank you a lot, Lisa. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, Sasha and Adrian and Albert. Uh, thank you, Sasha, as well. <laughs> thanks. Um, and I, I guess it's time flies indeed, and it's time to, for us to proceed to um, an online concert. Um, we're ready to start it in a few minutes. And today's concert is composed of the pre-recorded pieces by the composers that are present at the current edition of the portfolio, such as Alex Haikevich, Svetoslav Lunyov, Maxim Kulamiets, Adrian Mokano, Maxim Shalihin, Anna Arkushina, Jana Shlebanska, Anna Korsun, um, Oksish Murak, 
Голтон Алмаші, Роман Григорів та Ілія Розумейко, Сергій Вілка, Борис Логінов, Олексій Войтенко та Людмила Юрін. Um, you will see proper program uh, in the chat, but also in our Facebook. Uh, it's going to be there as a PDF for your convenience. And the duration of the concert is about one hour and 45 minutes. So perhaps it would be a good idea to make some tea and find a cozy sofa and uh, enjoy it from there. And we invite you all to feel free to switch off your microphones and cameras. Um, cameras can stay. Cameras won't stay. Okay, you, your choice. So that you can relax and uh, our video streams could be fully immersive for all the viewers. Uh, we will also turn off our, like I will turn my camera for sure. Uh, so in case we won't see all of you at the end of the concert, uh, we would like to thank again everyone who was present with us today, all of you, our guests, Many thanks to our co-hosts and co-streamers of the event, uh, to our speakers. Special thanks to Goat Institute and especially Reimer Volker, as well as to Field Notes Director Lisa Venus and Initiative Neue Musik, Berlin. Huge gratitude to all our fantastic portfolio members. And uh, my personal thanks to our entire uh, dream team of uh, KCMD. Uh, please feel free to explore the portfolio. We will distribute the link uh, to it for your convenience once again. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, remarks, feel free to leave them in the Zoom chat or write to our um, email address, kcmd at kcmd.eu. Um, and please take care and enjoy the music. <laughs>